Um, just a little bit of, of, of background. I, um, as Max said, I have a, um, a background in, as an early childhood teacher. I was a kindergarten teacher for about 11 years, and um, I no longer tell my students how long I've been in teacher education because it's longer than most of them have been born. Um, but I've had also a very strong interest and background around professional development, working with my dear friend Deb Wansborough on the professional development contracts at um, the old Wellington College of Education and Victoria University for many years, doing some um, evaluations of ministry funded PD, um, and then uh, I've got quite a strong research kind of platform around professional learning and development and um, situated cognition, situated learning um, that sort of influences where I'm, where I'm uh, working at the moment. So. What I thought would be quite nice is for you to just to talk to the person next to you, and I know some of you are a little way away from each other, but just think about the most effective professional learning that you've engaged in in the last couple of years, and what it was that made it really effective professional learning for you. So, I'll give you just a minute just to have a conversation and say hi to the people next to you and introduce yourself if you don't know them. Okay, so if you think about the most effective professional learning, sorry, I've cut you off a bit early there, but if you think about the most effective professional learning you've been engaged in in the last couple of years, any, any ideas about what it was that made it effective? What do you want to throw a, a gem out? Something you were passionate about, yep, so it was really meaningful for you? Anything else? It was practical, okay, you could apply it straight away. Okay, so it pulled together theory and research and, and with the practice. Yep. Anything else? It was fun. It was fun? Yeah, okay, so it engaged you. Yep. Right, an international perspective, so you were able to draw on ideas from outside of, of our context. It used our bodies and our minds. Yeah, good. So a very holistic kind of approach to it. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, well, it'll be interesting to see whether you make connections with what I'm going to talk about in relation to professional learning communities and what makes those effective um, as we go on. So what I want to do with this session is to begin really by just briefly touching on the fact that we've, we've got a really, we've had a lot of change in both the professional and the policy context for early childhood professional learning over the last 15 years and just walk you through some of those changes. I then want to introduce the idea of professional learning communities, what makes them, um, what characterises them, what makes them particularly effective, um, and then share some of the research that's um, been undertaken in New Zealand in particular um, in the early childhood context and just to wrap up with some, some findings and implications and to do that leaving time for some discussion at, at the end there. Um, so, if we think about the changing context, and we think first around the policy area, we all know um, how many of you are registered certificated teachers? Okay, so quite a number of you are. So you would know that with the new um, standards for the profession, that uh, one of the standards requires around professional learning, and it requires that um, certificated teachers, in order to maintain their certification, must use critical inquiry, collaborative problem solving and professional learning to improve professional capability to impact on the learning and achievement of all learners. So there's a clear expectation that if you are a registered teacher that you need to be engaged in ongoing professional learning. The education early childhood regulations have a statement in there around um, the requirement for um, for management to provide opportunities for staff um, to engage in regular professional learning um, and in other parts in the um, criteria, in the licensing criteria, I talk about the need to have a budget for professional learning. 
Um, and the Eero um, framework for early childhood reviews, for those of you who have been um, and have had your service undergo a review since um, 2014 would know that the self-review document that you complete as an early childhood service includes questions about what sort of professional learning has been undertaken by the staff in the service, how is that being supported, and if you're part of an umbrella organisation, their self-review also requires them to um, articulate what kind of professional learning that, that they have, in, have been engaged, uh, they've supported their staff to engage in. Alongside those um, policy contexts that we've got, though, we've also got some huge changes and shifts in our workforce in, in the early childhood area. So since 2002, there has been a 22% increase in the number of early childhood services in New Zealand overall. And that increase has been predominantly in the teacher-led service. So there has been a 50% increase in teacher-led services. There's been a 97% decrease in the number of sessional centres from 717 in 2002 to 22 in 2016. And the latest figures aren't out yet, so I don't know what... what that's probably dropped a little bit more. It's quite... It, it's not until you kind of go back and look at it and you think, wow, that's a really big shift in the structure and the nature of early childhood within, um, within Aotearoa New Zealand. What it's done is it has, it has created the need for a lot more early childhood teachers in those teacher-led services. Not only are there more services, but with people moving from sessional to full-day licences, the ratios are improved and there are more teachers required. So we've had a 106% increase in the number of staff in teacher-led services in that 12 years from 2002 to 2014, and just under 13,000 more qualified registered teachers, so a 216% increase. And every one of those qualified registered teachers needs to be engaging in ongoing professional learning in order to maintain their certification. Um, and the proportion of qualified registered teachers has increased from 46% to um, 74% as of 2014. And, and as I say, that. The last time I looked at the data, there wasn't anything later than that available on, on Education Counts. But you can see it is a very different workforce than it was um, in the teacher-led area than it was <coughs> 15 years ago. We've also had really strong, really big changes in the ministry-funded um, professional development. So those of you who, who um, have some history in the early childhood sector know that between 1997 and 2010, the Ministry's Professional Learning and Development funding was based on every early childhood service having access to in-depth professional development every three years. And it was a rotational cycle. One of the things that Deb and I found out when we did an evaluation in 2005 was that some services were really good at getting access more than every three years, and some services were often so disorganised that they couldn't actually get to access anything, um, and often, often missed out. 2010, along with a lot of other changes in the um, early childhood policy and funding area, the Ministry shifted to a targeted approach to PLD, and they introduced the um, CELO program. So the amount of, of funding went down from around about um, 11 and a half million, I think, to about five and a half million of on memory. Whilst, at the same time, the number of teachers is going up. 2014, we had the introduction of the COLS, the Communities of Learning Kahuiako Initiative for Schools, um, with the intention that up to 250 kahu, Kahuiako would be established. And as August this year, there are 210 Kahuiako that are in, in existence with 279 early childhood services participating in those. So initially early childhood wasn't part of it, it was a, an initiative that was developed in the schooling sector, part of the ministry, and it's been taken quite a lot of effort from um, early childhood to advocating to um, include early childhood services in there, and it's just starting to kind of grow and snowball a little bit there. So big shifts in the way that the ministry engages in, in um, providing PLD for, for early childhood. And then if you think about the external PLD that's available for people, when I looked at the Gazette of the 16th of October this year and looked at what was the early childhood focused professional learning and development offerings across New Zealand, 
There were two one and a half day early childhood programs, a sort of mini conferences. There were two two day programs focused on working with children with autism. There was one three day educational leadership program that went across the education sectors. And there were 66 one off symposiums, workshops, and short courses. And they were over a range of topic areas. Some of them were focused on management aspects. Quite a large number of them were focused on aspects of um, supporting children with learning needs. Um, and a number of them were, were more widely available. So you kind of put all of those things together and you get to a place of thinking there's not a lot of PLD available for teachers in the early childhood sector. So I think where I'm sort of sitting at the moment is that we need to rethink how we engage in professional learning and development. Um, we can't, we'd like to hope that the ministry would be more engaged. We'd like to hope that the um, kahuiaku will um, engage and, and involve more early childhood services. Um, but if we look at kind of how things have gone, there isn't the resourcing that's being provided there to support us in that, in that area. So we need to often think, I think, about how do we create um, the opportunities for ourselves to engage in professional learning that aren't necessarily going to be reliant on a ministry funded contract um, or somebody providing a short course for us once every three months that we might be able to go to. And I realise that a lot of people are working in services with an umbrella organisation where the PLD is provided in-house and it's a kind of a domestic programme if you like, an in-house programme for you there. Um, so I think the other thing too is if we start to become involved in the um, kahuiako and the coals, then we need to, there's a set of skills and dispositions and knowledge that, that people need in order to be able to participate in those in effective kind of ways. Um, and so the work that my colleague Kate Thornton and I have been doing on professional learning communities seems to offer us some, some um, ways forward, some promise for us in terms of thinking about how we might engage in um, in ongoing professional learning and development. So if we think about what are PLCs, they're defined by Hip and Huffman as professional educators working collectively and purposefully to create and sustain a culture of learning for all students and adults. And I think the really important word in there is all. It's not just some children, some, some students. They're, Hip and Huffman are writing from the schooling sector but it's about how do we create those, um, that culture of learning for, for everybody. And Lois Easton writes about a group of educators who meet regularly to engage in professional learning for the purpose of enhancing their practice as educators in order to help all children succeed in learners. So again, there's that really strong emphasis on, on all and a really strong emphasis on us learning in order to support children and young, um, young people's learning. So currently most of the literature around professional learning communities comes from the schooling sector, um, quite strong within the US. We Increasingly though we're seeing um, research being undertaken in the early childhood sector and starting in the higher education context and, and, a, and a much more international um, focus. And Kate, as an example at the moment, is in Denmark talking with um, teachers over there. So um, it, it's, it's moving everywhere else. So there are a number of, of characteristics that seem to underpin effective professional learning communities and I just want to quickly run through some of those. There's ideas about having a shared mission and vision and values that, that if we are all on the same page, if we know what it is that we're trying to achieve, what our goals are, what our vision, our philosophy is for our early childhood service and we're working together, then we actually make much greater progress in terms of um, supporting our own learning and supporting children's learning. It's around engaging in collaborative, uh, collective inquiry in collaborative teams so that we're working together in order to, to strengthen things. Very strong action orientation. So it's around seeing that we might want to work on an area, identifying that there are issues. Often kind of an action research model works really well in professional learning communities. Um, but trying things out, experimenting with things, having a go at, at things and seeing whether they'll work with that intention to continually improve what it is that we do. And whilst they talk um, around being results orientated, it doesn't have to be a narrow kind of national standards sort of a definition of, of, of results orientated. It's thinking about, so what is our vision? What is our philosophy? What do we want children to have gained from being in our early childhood service? And how do we support children and, and stay focused on, on that end goal of that actually while children are here, 
We want them to be strong in, who they're, in their cultural identity. We want them to have opportunities to be excited about engaging with learning in lots of different um, domain areas. We want them to have developed the skills to be able to engage with other people in socially competent kind of ways, all of those. So it doesn't have to be a narrow, you know, often people look at things like results focused and think it's very narrow, it's preparation for school stuff. It doesn't have to be. It can be what it is that we want it to be. Um, Hip and Huffman have some commonalities there around, shared and support, um, around the shared visions and values, but one of the things that they're a little different around is that they identify the importance of shared and supportive leadership. So the positional leaders are really important in terms of being enablers, but it's not reliant just on the positional leaders. And in effective PLCs, leadership is distributed and, and people across the team, across the PLC, are, are enabled to be able to contribute um, in leadership in leaderful kind of ways. So again, similar in terms of collective learning and application. Something, again, a little different is around shared personal practice, that idea of deprivatising our practice, of laying it open for others to look at and to comment on and to critique and to unpack. And to do that, we need to have the supportive conditions, particularly around relationships. So the levels of relational trust need to be really high so that we um, feel safe about opening ourselves up, sharing our practice, thinking about you know, being able to say, mm, that didn't work so well, maybe how can I try doing it differently? Being able to give feedback and critique each other is really important. But also supportive structures around the time and the space for people to get together and talk about teaching and learning. And that's often really challenging in the early childhood sector, when, particularly if you're in full-day service. One of the things for me around shared personal practice that I had kind of one of those real aha moments when I was doing my PhD was um, working with teachers where I'd videoed them working um, together, uh, videoed episodes of them teaching, and then they had um, focus group interviews where we looked at the videos and they talked about what was happening in the teaching. And they said it was really, um, really strong, powerful PLD for them because they didn't get the chance to look at and talk to each other about their teaching very much. And it was kind of, I mean, I should have kind of figured it years ago, but it was one of those things about, you know, we're so busy teaching the group of children or the child or doing this, that or the other thing, we've got no idea what our colleagues are doing half the time. Um, and in, but using video is a really powerful way of actually creating spaces for us to have those, those kind of conversations. Okay. So Stoll and Fink argue that effective le um, professional learning communities treat teachers as professionals. Okay, so you're not being treated as somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and who has to have your faults remedied. Um, but it promotes and they promote high quality staff development, encourage teachers' leadership and participation, and they promote collaboration so that we work together in order to improve. They also develop ways to be able to induct and include and develop new members. And, and I'll come back to that, that point later on because that's been one of the really strong findings that Kate and I have had in our work. They function successfully within their context and they work to change the things that matter. So they don't get tied up thinking about the administrivia stuff that doesn't matter. They're focused on teaching and on learning. And they have those processes and those procedures that elicit trust. And professional learning communities are situated or positioned within a particular approach to thinking about, about learning. Um, one that's described in the literature is situated cognition. And Putnam and Walco, who um, are very well known in the, in the professional um, learning literature, describe a situative perspective as one in which cognition is situated in particular physical and social context, so we, our thinking, our learning is happening in a particular context, and for us as early childhood teachers, that's generally within our early childhood service. It's social in nature, so we are engaging with others rather than sitting in our room on our own, um, or watching our YouTube video on our own, or whatever, although you can still do that. Um, and it's also distributed across the individual across other people and across the tools that we use. And those tools might be, might be observations, might be videos, might be using the, um, the assessment data that we've, we've had, um, collected on children, the, the portfolios that we have. And they can support powerful shifts 
in teacher um, thinking and in teacher practices. Because it's embedded in the work you do, it draws on the work that you do, and it mean, it's meaningful for you. And you can take it, you, you're thinking back, try it out in the work that you're doing on a daily basis. So you get into this lovely cycle of reflection and thinking and um, trying out and experimenting and talking about things and, and keeping on going with, with that. So, just a minute for you to talk to the people next to you. How do these ideas about PLCs, um, do, they, do they differ from the settings that you're familiar with? Are they similar? Do you, can you think, yep, I can see that happening in the place that I work or where I've worked or the people that I've worked with? What distinguishes being a, and, and being part of a PLC from a, a more typical way that you might be used to working? So just have a minute or two to, to think and talk to the person next to you. Okay, so we'll come back. Sorry, to, to you're probably just getting started. There's a really lovely um, quote about professional learning communities by Grossman, Weinberg and Woolworth, and they say that a, a professional learning community is more than a group of teachers sitting in a room together. And quite often you'll hear people say, oh yes, well we're a learning community, we're this, that or the other. But actually just because we sit together, just because we work in the same place, doesn't make us necessarily a professional learning community. Um, and so that we do need to find the ways of, of working in, in particular, particular kind of ways. So there are multiple constructs around how PLCs develop over time, that they tend to move from having not been initiated, so a, 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 a team that just works together but isn't starting to think and work together in the kind of ways that, that a PLC would, into initiation where they get started, they're then starting to implement, they're starting to become one and doing it, and then they get to a point where it becomes institutionalised. It's embedded in, the, in their practice. It becomes part of the way that they are and who they are and the way of being, if you like. And uh, when Kate and I did our, we've just done a series of focus groups with the um, centres we've been working with in our latest program, um, project, and they talked, the teachers talked about how embedded um, aspects of, of changed practice had become. And they, they're probably still sitting at the implementation stage um, in fact, they are still sitting there, um, and some parts they're still just getting started on, but there were already some parts of their practice that were becoming embedded in terms of how they talk to each other um, about things and their, their sense of that they, they would be, it was about being rather than doing. So you don't do a PLC, you, you are, you become one, you, you know, it's a, a way of being. So thinking about some of the research projects, and the, the first one in New Zealand that looked at PLCs in early childhood was the survey that, um, that Kate and Deborah did back in 2012, where they used um, Hip and Huffman's um, survey and adapted it for the early childhood context here, and surveyed um, the perceptions of early childhood teachers and professional learners, uh, leaders. Sorry. Following that, Kate and I then have, did a pilot project um, in 2012 with four um, PLCs where we were looking at the structural and relational factor, factors that influence the effectiveness of the PLCs 
Um, and then we moved after that into a two and a half year project where we've just collected our final lot of data at this point. We'll probably go back in a year and see how they're going um, and maybe another year after that to see how they've been able to sustain it. And we've been focused very much on, on the sustainability and the shifts in teachers' practices as a result of their involvement. Um, one of Kate's um, Recent graduate students, um, Rachel Denis, has just finished her master's looking at leadership in PLCs, and she's just starting her PhD now, which is, um, again, going to have quite a strong PLC focus um, in there. So there's not a lot of, of um, research, but there's, there's a bit, and it's a growing bit, and we've, we've Kate and I have both got the other postgrad students who are um, looking at PLCs in different kind of contexts um, there. So the project, that the first survey that Kate and... Um, and Deborah did looked and sought teacher and professional leaders' perspectives using 36 indicators over six key areas. And I'm sorry, it's probably a little small for people at the back. So there was an area around collective learning and application, and there were a number of, of, of indicators there. For example, that the dialogue between teachers focuses on strengthening teaching and learning. Another section around um, shared personal practice, and, and one of the indicators was that around the opportunities exist for coaching and mentoring. In terms of thinking about shared and su supportive leadership, there was an indicator around leadership is promoted and nurtured amongst teachers. Shared values and vision, an indicator around collaborative processes existing in order to develop shared visions and shared val values amongst staff. In terms of those supportive relationship conditions, um, an indicator around relationships amongst teachers support honest and respectful examination of data to enhance teaching and learning. And finally, around the support of structural conditions, one of the indicators was around time is provided to facilitate collaborative learning and shared practice. So 36 indicators across these, these six areas. What they found was that um, uh, teachers were less positive than professional leaders, so teachers did saw that things sat at a, at a, at a lower level. They, they were less likely to strongly agree, whereas the, um, the uh, positional leaders were more likely to strongly agree and, and have a, lo a rosier kind of view of, of how things were. Um, but they found five areas in, in particular where they felt that further development needed to occur based on the responses from, from both teachers and professional leaders. And the first was around that support from the professional leader that, that lots of respondents were saying that it was insufficient. That there needed to be a lot stronger, a lot more opportunities for engaging in um, feedback and coaching and mentoring. Um, and that there needed to be strengthening of the relationships with parents and whānau in order to support children's learning. That there needed um, to be increased willingness to embed change into the culture of the service and time for shared reflection and meaningful com conversations around teaching and learning. So they were the five areas that, that across the survey, teachers and positional leaders were likely to rank the lowest. Got that right, Kate? Um, do you have a no good collection. Okay. okay. So if we think about the projects that, that Kate and I have been done, and our first project, which was a pilot over about um, nine months, we had two main research questions. Um, well, one main research question around what factors contribute to effective PLC, um, and then looking in, in particular areas what organisation and structural factors influence the effectiveness, and what relational and interpersonal factors influence the, the effectiveness of them. So, oops, sorry, I've just gone to, too far. So our data collection was um, predominantly qualitative. We did have some quantitative um, data in terms of, of we reproduced the survey with the, with the teachers involved. Uh, we began with a full day seminar to kind of introduce the notion of PLCs, um, set the project up with them, get them kind of knowing how to use Moodle, which was one of our kind of repositories for, for gathering data for their reflective journals. And we met with each of the PLCs that we were working with um, from March till July, which is a very short time frame in the, in the context of developing PLCs. And they also did a range of online activities at the same time. Followed up the survey in August, and then back in November, we, we brought them back together for a group interview. Um, and part of our timing around that was that um, 
we were both um, away for a chunk of time, which meant that it was hard to gather data. The way that research projects end up not always been quite the way you'd intended them to be. So we had two structures for our PLCs, and these were ones that were very familiar to early childhood teachers in the areas that we were working in because of the professional development contracts that had previously been in place. So we had two whole centre PLCs where all of the teachers were involved, and then we had two clusters, one that focused around leadership and one that focused around um, reflective practice, and that's because Kate and I were each interested in those areas respectively. Um, and in the cluster PLCs, two or three teachers from each of the centres came and, um, and participated and then fed back to their services. So we asked each of the um, groups to identify a focus for themselves. So they had a, a little action research question that they were working on throughout the project um, because you have to have something that you're working on in order to be kind of engaging in the work of, of um, and becoming a PLC. So uh, the first centre, Pia Waka Waka, um, had, a, had a question around how they can develop their practices in Te Kahanga Me Te Reo Māori. Uh, Rio Rio Early Learning Centre was focused very much on how they can make their rituals and routines um, a much more peaceful kind of um, experience, and they ended up targeting right in on their lunchtime routine. In the leadership, we had a range of things. So some te one centre was looking at what teachers needed to do to empower children so that they could um, practice our core um, and, and be leaders in their, in their, in their centre. Um, another had um, a big issue that was happening for them around transition to school, so they were, were wanting to look at how they could kind of engage their community in that process of, of kind of redeveloping their, their, their approach. Um, and then ones around developing leadership within the teaching team and also fostering children's leadership. In the reflective practice, we were we had people we had, we only had three services in the reflective practice one, and they were looking at things like um, how effective was their team culture and enabling them to really critically look at their own and each other's practice, um, how they could enhance their critical reflections on their investigative project approach and how they could enhance their practice to support children's social competence. So they each kind of took a, wee, a, you know, a more narrow focus that they, were, that they were looking at. And despite being a relatively short-term pilot, we did find some, some you know, interesting and probably some slightly predictable kind of results in it. So the influence of structural conditions, and you can probably guess where some of these are going. So changes to the physical environment. Um, we had one of the centres who um, because of earthquake um, concerns, had to move out of their building for about four months during the process, so that had an impact on, on what was happening to them. Uh, we had another service where um, this was around the time that the changes to the licensing requirements came out, so the two services side by side combined under one, um, one license, and that changed the way they worked together as a team. Um, and there were lots of staff changes as well, so people, um, you know, teachers leaving, teachers going on parental leave, changes, um, and one service where they had felt that they were, in the words of Marion, just flying, we were having robust debates, they were the ones who were looking at you know, how they could strengthen their critical culture, staff changed, the new person who came in didn't want to know, didn't want to engage, and, and, and Marion spoke quite um, very sadly at the end about how that had kind of really shifted because of the, the impact of the one person. But the other thing that was really, really um, strong was around the time for people to meet together. So apart from our opening workshop um, seminar, which was on a Saturday, every one of our meetings with the groups were, on, were in the evenings because we had a mix of um, education and care and kindergartens, and so that was the only time they could meet. And I probably don't need to... Um, telling you view about the challenges of, of doing all of that. Um, the influence of relational conditions. Um, what was really interesting with one of the um, whole centre services was that their positional leader had um, nominated them and put their names forward to be part of the project, but then decided not to be involved, um, which was kind of really interesting. And within, quite quickly within that particular team, we could see there were lots of issues around trust amongst the team leaders, uh, the team members, um, and they ended up picking um, their topic, we think, because they felt it was a fairly safe, um, non-controversial one, um, and, and allowed them, 
hint to there was probably a little bit of it was allowing them to shut down somebody else who was trying to dominate by going for this one because this person wanted that. <coughs> but actually, if we went for this one, we'd all feel a bit safer about it and that would shut that person down. So it's oh, kind of interesting. And, and in their reflective journals, we got um, you know quite a lot of comments that were showing us that there was potential for trust to be built, but actually there were also lots of issues around, around trust. So in this one, you know, trust is an important issue, one I thought we all shared in equal amounts. However, the deeper into this project we go, found it's not so. But they were positive. I do believe this action research will provide a good opportunity to build and work on trust within the staff. Unfortunately, by the end of the project, when they came back in, in um, November for that final interview, it was quite clear that actually it hadn't worked, like they just, it had, it had just faded away and um, yeah, it was quite, quite sad there. Um, in contrast, in the other service, um, the other whole centre service, the teachers, it was a very diverse service, they had nine staff, there were five different ethnicities represented across the team, um, there was a mix of qualified, unqualified and in training staff, um, part-time um, full time, quite a you know really diverse, but probably quite typical team, um, and the the positional leaders in that team worked really really hard to build that trust and to create a really safe place, and they were doing it through cr deliberately creating more time and making sure that a lot of the administrative stuff happened elsewhere so that they could use their meeting times to talk, and having lots of one on one with staff outside of the meeting times in order to support them there. We also found in terms of um, promoting collaborative inquiry that it, it required and, and needed them to engage in quite deliberate and focused investigation onto children's learning. And so having that action research foco was really important because it kind of gave them a structure and a, and a direction to be going to in terms of researching their own practice. But again, it came back to the relational trust. So where the services had low trust, the teams had low trust, the conversations were superficial. Where there was higher trust, then there was a much deeper level of professional dialogue, um, and, and they were able to challenge professional practice. Um, we also looked at the difference between the two models. So in the whole centre, um, those pre-existing relationships and the relational conditions were hugely influential for both as enablers, but also as barriers. Um, the online process that we used was really helpful for one of them in particular. They found it created a way where people could um, contribute without feeling under pressure to do it in the group meetings. So for some of their staff who needed a little bit you know, more time to process and think about things, that it worked really well. Um, cluster groups were interesting because you got a much wider diversity of views and experiences and as Olivia described it, the cross-pollination of ideas, they really enjoyed that. And you didn't have the baggage coming along that you had in the existing teams, but you had a different kind of constraint or challenge in the fact that these teachers were working in their PLC but then they were going back to their own centres and there wasn't necessarily the same amount of buy-in that was happening. Okay, so I'm trying to go fast so we get through everything, we're not too far off. So in terms of our implications, um, we also provided a really structured model so that they knew where they were going um, with the process and what we were focused on. And we slowed them down in terms of going from identifying their area of focus and trying to solve whatever issues they saw. So we used to slow them down and say, no, no, you've got to gather data. You've got to find out what's happening and think about it before. Because as teachers, we often go straight into trying to find the answers to things and trying to implement the answer. Um, but we also found, you know, several challenges um, that the system, we need much longer time frames. So that six months or so was not long enough to be able to, de to develop sustainable PLCs, um, particularly where you had the challenges around some of those structural and relational conditions there. Um, and in order for teachers to be able to engage in that robust data collection and the critical reflection, um, they needed to have shifts in their, in their thinking. So our second project um, has looked more about how does the, um, the sustainability of PLCs. So how does it support changes in teacher practices that lead to improved teaching and enhanced learning? Um, but again, also thinking about the organisational and structural factors um, and the relational and interpersonal factors and how they influence 
um, sustainability. So this project um, ran for two and a half years, so we're, say, we've just finished our last lot of data collection um, in, in October. So we had two PLCs. Um, one PLC A was made up from teachers from three different services um, who uh, were in separate locations but had a, um, a connection, an umbrella organisation, and they right from the word go decided they wanted to focus on the integration of te ao Māori within their practice and strengthen that. PLCB was made up of teachers from three co-located services, so three subgroups within a larger team um, in the same building but with separate spaces. And initially not all of the teachers wanted to take part, but they, this team decided that they would hold their meetings at the same time just before their, their regular staff meeting and people could come. And over time, um, what happened was that people kind of got drawn into it and um, sort of came and became part of it almost um, by osmosis, really. And they decided first they wanted to focus on children leading their own learning um, and then had kind of quite a shift after about 18 months and have since shifted to focusing on, on increasing and strengthening their bicultural practices. Very similar kind of approach to the data collection, so I won't take a lot of time going through there, but. Um, we have a wealth of qualitative data that we are working our way through at the moment. In terms of the structure, what we found really interesting was that, that the first PL, PLCA began really strongly because they had identified that focus. They knew kind of right from the word go where they wanted to go, but there wasn't, uh, they were still kind of figuring out who was part of it and who wasn't and how that fitted with the rest of the three centres that they, that they came from. And there were some tensions within the three centres and within the teams within the three centres about what the role of the PLC was and how it would impact on, on their work. Um, and so it was harder to make group shifts. And it's probably only been in the last, since the beginning of this year, that they've really shifted um, in, in some of their practices. In contrast, PLCB took longer to get underway. They went round in circles for quite a long time trying to sort out what their, their area of focus was. Um, two of the three groups really worked um, well on it. One of them's done some fantastic work around infants and toddlers leading their own learning and, um, and how they've been documenting that. Um, but over time, they really, because they were talking in that big team, they have been really able to increase their critical reflection and and embed some of their, their shifts into their, into their practice. Um, I was just rereading the last um, focus group interviews on the, on the plane on the way up, so it was sort of at the front of my brain. And in both services, both, both PLCs, um, they had quite a lot of staff changes, and the newer teachers were saying that they recognised and saw a very strong difference in how the teachers talked together, that teachers were much more critical, much more open to discussion, uh, were having conversations everywhere, um, not just at staff meeting time, um, would, would, would critique each other, would ask for help from each other, were really open in it, and they said it was unlike the experiences that they had had in other early, ch um, in other early childhood teams. So some of the things that we found out in order to develop sustainable PLCs is there is a need for clear membership. People kind of need to know who's, who's in and who's not. Um, but also effective induction for the new members. In one of them, there was only, by the time we finished, only one teacher who had been there at the beginning, partly because they'd had about, in total, there were about five teachers who either went on parental leave or are about to go on parental leave. Um, so some of them will come back, um, and, but they've had, you know, they've had time in and out of it. Um, and in the other one, they had also quite a lot of staff changes and changes within the groups, so people moving um, within the, the groups internally. And some of the newer ones said, we had no idea what was going on, because we'd kind of assumed as the facilitators that the staff would induct them, and they kind of you know, assumed that we would induct them. So what's come out for us is that there needs to be really clear induction processes for people so they understand what it is about the way that, that, that people are trying to work in this particular service and how they, how they go about it. Um, there does need to be that shared focus and that commitment and the research orientation so that teachers are thinking about themselves as researchers into their own practice in order to, to strengthen teaching. And there needs to be clarity of roles, particularly around the leadership. And, uh, and PLCA, the positional leader, had said right at the beginning that she wanted to step back and just be a member of the team. 
but people kept waiting for her to do things, and when she'd stepped back and wasn't doing things, things kind of stuttered along. And at times they were waiting for us to do things, and we're saying, we're here to research and see how you go, not to actually facilitate. So just really strong clarity around that's important. There do need to be those opportunities for dialogue and for deprivatising practice, the time and the space, and they've worked really hard to find ways to be able to do that. Um, and over this year, Kate and I have been part of their meetings much less. We've been kind of gone every three months because when we went, they would tell us what they'd been doing rather than talking to each other about what they were doing. So they, and they've both groups said they've found it much more satisfying in the last six months because they are talking to each other, not, not to us, um, and, and engaged in their real kind of work. But both also, we found people need that stimulus of new ideas. So on occasions, we would introduce things, but we also brought in some external people to, um, to support teachers in terms of moving, moving forward. So, sorry, I'm running a little late, but two minutes, I think we've got about three. These, what we, we were also interested in how mature the teachers themselves felt that their PLC had, had become. So, um, the, the blue on the, on the far side is that um, it hadn't started, um, through to um, started doing, and then the purple on the side was that it was embedded. So you can see for most of them that, um, and there were nine <coughs> teachers who responded to this one, and they didn't all answer every, every question, um, but you can see that they, in most cases, thought that they had kind of got, got started. Um, collective learning was seen as more embedded than anything else and shared learning um, and shared practice, sorry, was least likely to be um, recognised by them as either doing or embedded, so it was kind of further, further down. In the PLCB, we found that um, if we looked and compare, combined those doing and embedded categories, um, that supportive relationships was the, was the highest one, the one at this end. Um, and such, um, shared practice was next with slightly higher numbers of people um, suggesting that it was embedded. So that's the one third from the end. Um, what we found really interesting was that if you look at the one on the far end around shared learning, nobody thought that it was embedded. And we'd have to say from our kind of observations as the researchers that we're kind of not surprised about that because the positional leader did quite a lot of out the front leading, if you like. Um, but across each of the dimensions, only about half, uh, sorry, only about quarter saw that they'd embedded various practices into their, um, or various um, characteristics into their practices. And then we've tried to put them together and compare them. So PLC A is the solid, and PLC B is the, is the dotted line. And it's probably we need to be a little bit careful about trying to make any comparisons because there were slightly different numbers of teachers in the, in the two groups. Um, but we can see that PLCB had higher ratings for the supportive relationships, the one at this end, um, and for the shared practices and for the shared values and visions. But what, as I said before, what was also of interest to us was um, in the qualitative data around this when we talked to um, the newer teachers talked about and, and their responses on, a, on the spinal questionnaire was around the differences in the way that teachers talk together in the, um, in the, in the, in the centres, much more critical, much more engaged in discussion and debate, much more focused on children's learning than they had been in other places. So just quickly to wrap up, some of the um, implications for practice are around um, needing to constantly build that capacity and resilience, particularly when staff turnover occurs. Um, there are challenges, there are both strengths and challenges with the whole centre model and the cluster models, and I don't think either of them, you know, one's not necessarily better than the other. I do think in terms of the kahui ako, though, that the cluster model that they've got is an enormous model because there are so many people involved, and I think that's going to be one of the challenges that the kahui ako have, is how do we actually really engage people across so many schools and potentially early childhood services. Um, it's really hard to be the lone person going back in and, and making change there. Um, so developing those will be, will be challenging. And I guess just a couple of, of questions to leave, um, to leave you with, you know, what, what would need to happen to ensure your teaching teams were operating as professional learning communities and what sort of support would you need to be able to make sure that this was a sustainable way of learning. So 
We'll stop there, and I'm sorry I've gone way over time for questions, perhaps, from people. Thank you so much, Sue, for this wonderful, provoking presentation. And we're going to open the floor for uh, questions or comments, or perhaps some of you would like to maybe answer or reflect upon the question that Sue has posted on yep, the slide. We have a couple of minutes before we, we continue our conversation with refreshments in the age group. Uh, no, when it was established, in two, when the initiative was rolled out in 2014, the intention would be that over time there would be 250. Oh, right. So that's what the funding model has, has um, is, is set up to enable 250. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so they're up to they're up to 210 of the 250 expected. Um, having said that, some of them are brand new, so they're you know, they're really early in. I, I know there's some work that was done by members of the Early Childhood um, Ministry's Early Childhood Advisory Committee, um, where they tried to think of a, a way of structuring because there are so many early childhood services that feed to multiple schools, particularly in, in urban areas. Um, if you're a smaller community, and I've, the one I think of in, in Wellington is like Wainui Martin with one secondary school, a couple of primary schools, and, and probably a dozen early childhood services. Logistically, it works really nicely for, for a coal because you've got a nice boundary around it. If you're in the middle of, of central Auckland or south Auckland, it's, it's kind of really challenging. So one of the pieces of advice that they'd given was is saying, OK, the ones who should be involved in a particular coal are the ones who perhaps have um, about at least you know a, a certain proportion of their children going to that school, so that they have a stronger kind of relationship. Because the other challenge is, is we've got four and a half thousand early childhood services, and you know about what fifteen hundred schools or something. So I don't think you'll get to a point where every early childhood service is part of a cult. I just think logistically it's probably too hard. But what you would hope is that you have some way that whoever is involved in the coal is also connecting and networking with the other services in the, in the area. Um, and I think probably the reason that some kindergartens are in there now is probably because there are better organisations through um, New Zealand Kindergarten Inc. has probably been really proactive in that space. And that again is a challenge in terms of Standalone not for profit services who or, or standalone private services who don't have that same umbrella organisation to, to connect with. Um, in terms of involvement with them, I mean, it, it's I think a space where we should be doing advocacy work about saying actually, if you're going to resource these, if you're going to involve early childhood people in there, then you need to resource it. So there needs to be the funding to enable them to engage properly. I think in a lot of places there's enormous potential for early childhood to have huge influence. Um, the impact of play-based learning coming into schools, I don't know whether it's happening in Auckland and Wellington, it's just taking off. Um, and there's an enormous amount of expertise and knowledge and understanding that early childhood people can contribute to. I do find it in a, in a certain way it's quite ironic that at the same time that play-based learning is really taking off in schools, there are some early childhood services that are getting more and more formal. Um, it's kind of like we are talking past each other in the, in the weirdest of ways. But I think that's a really strong potential place for us to carve out an area of expertise that we can be taking leadership on um, and go in and um, not feeling like we're the little sisters. Sometimes I think we take that on as our mentor instead of being kind of strong in who we are. I've got two questions. One about the, um, the TCE. Are there currently any 
I work in with Travel Castle and looking from the upside, not from the ECD side, but are there any initiatives around where local ECDs work together with the gardens with the not with the for profits with the not for profits currently? I think there's probably some informal ones, but I don't know of anything formal that's been established. Um, probably not helped by the level of competition that is existing in many communities um, because the ministry doesn't put any restrictions around um, requiring a demonstrated need for a new early childhood service before it's set up so new services can get set up, um, get their um, uh, resource consent, go through everything and then all they need to do is need their, their ministry um, sign off for licence. So that doesn't help collaboration. Yeah. I guess it's the same in, uh, in the schooling sector too. Yeah, and, and that's one of the other things that, that I think is going to take some time to work through in the Kahui Ako is around the fact that you've had organisations, institutions competing with each other who are now being told that they have to collaborate and are not necessarily given the support and the resourcing to help them learn how to collaborate together and develop those relationships and develop that trust. No, both, sorry, both groups did. Both groups did. Yeah, yeah. But it's taken that one where they don't work together. It's probably only been in the last since the beginning of the year they really shifted how they were thinking about it and, and reframed things. And in the last three months they've they've really started to talk as a whole. You know, bring bring more people than just a couple of people. Um, because one of the things that came from the um, early child advisory group to try and get the working out who could get into a cold or who couldn't was that they wanted whoever was in the cold to report back to uh, the, uh, the other early childhood services mm -hmm. so that people in the early childhood community knew what was happening in the cold. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you've got some really good leaders that could set that up as a Yep. So that's one little opportunity. The other opportunity is all the work around Tafari and the pedagogical champions oh, yeah, or yeah. whatever, curriculum champions yep. and stuff like that. So to me that's another opportunity where you could get, yes. you know. But I wonder whether, when those groups are meeting, whether they need to have a little bit of an um, intro to what needs to happen in the PLC so that they can sort of see what they're contributions or their responsibilities are yeah. to make it effective and not just be another meeting that you go with. Another group of teachers sitting in a room together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure because I haven't been inside a coal, but is there much work that happens around some of those characteristics around the building of trust and structures and things like that? Or does it vary? So it's a slow process, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, so you've got people who are just still figuring out what it is about, trying to bring new people who don't know what it's about on. And, 